Hi everyone, this is The Wild Snapper. Welcome back to my channel. Today's subject is going to be about the Colt Single Action Army. We are going to discuss primarily just the first generation Colt Single Action Army and all the minute and major changes that has taken place throughout. So, enjoy. So, first off, I figured we would start with the most well-known change, and that was how the base pin was held in. Um, if you look at number four, you'll see a circle in that area that's painted white. There would be a screw that would come in and tighten down to hold the base pin in place. If you look at number five, it's on the side. There is a little, it looks like a screw on each end, but it's spring-loaded pin, and you would push it, and then you could remove the base pin without any tools. So the screw style started in the 1873 first year model and went up till 1896 when it switched to the push from the side style release. Next we'll go to the change of the patent date markings. Number six is a two line format that had three dates on it for the patents. It was from 1873 to 1877. Now also number, notice on number six that there is no Colt logo on the side of the frame. So now we'll move to number seven, the three line format. It has the three patent dates, and this was done between 1877 to 1890. Now notice in this example, there is a Colt logo with a circle around it. This was done in the later part of the three line format, not the earlier part. The Circle Rampant Colt was from 1890 to 1912. Now we will move to number 8, which is the most common you'll usually see. It is a two-line format again, and this was done between 1890 through 1940. Now, if you notice, the Colt logo is no longer circled, and they started making it without the circle, in 1912 and that went up till 1940. Now for the hammers, the top part of the hammer, the knurling. Number nine was the very first style. It was long, it was known as the long knurl and that started in 1873 and went up till 1905 when number 10 stepped in. It was the shorter knurl and that was from 1905 to 1909. Then 11, your third style, which was called the curved border. It was from 1905 to 1909. Number 12 would be the fourth style, which had no border whatsoever, and it went from 1909 to 1936. Now, number 13, the fifth style, which is the bright side, where it was from 1936 to 1940, which the side of the entire hammer would have been polished. So now we will move to the sights on the single action army and the sights on the frame to be particular. Number one is called the pinch style, which when you look at where it's painted, if you look that it's round in the, the back and the front and in the middle, it almost looks like it was pinched. That was where your sight was. These are extremely rare and extremely expensive guns. They only did it on, I believe, a hundred, maybe a little bit more of the, the very first guns ever made. Now we'll move to number two, which was one of the most common sites from for 1873 to 1931, which was just a regular V-notch in the back. And then, now to number three, would be the square notch site. And that's what you usually see on modern replicas today, and that was from 1931 to 1940. So now we'll move to the cylinder. And this was a very small change that only happened for one year and it went back. Number 24 is the standard length flute. That was from 1873 to 1913. For one year, during 1914, they went with that longer style flute. And as I said, that lasted for one year. When they went back to the normal style flute in 1915. They only made 1,480 single action armies with the long style flute. Now the two cylinder bushings below each cylinder correspond with the cylinder it went with. So number 26 was the standard length and number 27 was just that one year with the long flute. So this next part is the trigger guard and more importantly the shape of the trigger guard. 
Number 22, if you look, is a little bit flatter on the bottom and larger than number 23. Number 22 was called the flat bottom bow. It went from 1873 to 1894. And now we would go to 23, which was called the round bottom bow, which was from 1894 to 1917. Now, right after 1917, they went back to the, 20, the number 22 style, the flat bottom bow, until 1940. In the bottom far right part of that grip would be a spot that could have a locating pin for two-piece grips. And the two-piece grips with that pin started coming out in 1882. And you could either have with the, the locating pin or without. Without would have meant you had a one-piece grip. And with the locating pin means you would have had a two-piece grip. So if you look at number 23, on the rear of the trigger guard on the left side, you'll see a caliber marking. Now that was in that position on number 22 from 1873 to 1877. And if you look at number 22, there's a caliber marking on the front left part of that trigger bar. Uh, trigger guard bow and it was there from 1881 to 1887 so after 1887 it went back to the position that you would see on number 23 the left rear so now we're going to be looking at the firing pin that's embedded in the hammer and this is actually my biggest pet peeve on replica guns and number 17 is the cone style. It went from 1873 to 1905. In 1905, they went to the number 18, which is the scalloped style. The scallop style is admittedly a better firing pin. But to me personally, I think the gun looks much better with the cone style firing pin. So now we are going to dis discuss assembly numbers. Number 19, the, under the frame and the gate of number 20, there will be a two, three, or four digit assembly number. This assembly number will not be the same as the serial number. And if you look at number 21, from 1909 to 1940, they had moved it to the back part of the frame under there. But as number 19, from 1873 to 1909. So now we are going to discuss grips. Number 14 is a one piece oiled walnut grip and it was from 1873 until 1940 you could order it special like that. Now in 1882 for the civilian model number 15 came out which was the it was a hard rubber, it was called gutta percha, and it had an eagle at the very bottom holding a banner, and that was from 1882 to 1896. And number 16 is when the hard rubber later style grip came out without the eagle. Now there was an intermittent between these two that did not have the eagle, but if you look at number 15 and then you look at number 16, you'll notice that the Colt logo at the top is tilted ever so slightly on number 15. That intermediate would have looked just like that without the eagle on the grip. And then it went to number 16, which was from 1896 to 1940. So now we're gonna talk about the rifling in the barrel. Number 30, which was from 1873 to 1910, was a rounded, or they called it a bead style rifling. It was very thin, rounded small little area that was actually rifled the 31 was the later after 1910 to 1940 which was the flat style of rifling it's much wider and it's what you would see if you look down most barrels of reproductions so now we'll talk about the actual caliber markings on the barrel number 40 the first style from 1887 to 1929 was the caliber only on the left side, just forward of the frame. Number 41 was the second style, which was from 1929 to 1940. And that actually said an inscription that said Colt Single Action Army Caliber 
45 or whatever caliber the firearm was in. So now we're going to talk about the front sight post. Number 38 and 39 are a result of when Colt switched from the V-based rear sight to the U-based rear sight. So the number 38 is known as the small narrow sight blade. And number 39 is also known as the larger, wider front sight blade. So looking at the overall profile of these two sights, you can't really rely on that to, as a way to pick them out. And the reason I say this is, is most front sights were filed in an attempt to get the single action army to shoot closer to point of aim. Now we'll discuss the side markings on the Colt Frontier 6 shooter, which is the single action army basically in 4440. So number 35 is the etched panel. And that was between 1878 to 1890. It's very hard to see in this picture, but the etching looks almost like a picture more or less in the side. If you look at this picture very close, you can see it. So number 36 is from 1890 to 1923. They then used a roll die to mark it out. And number 37 was from 1923 to 1940, where they just changed the font and added the 4440 at the end. So now to our two base pins. Now number 28 is has a small hole on each end because these were made turning between centers on a lathe. And that small hole on each end was from 1873 to 1903. The one with no hole on each side, because it was manufactured, it's just a little bit different, has no hole on each end of the base pan, and that was from 1903 to 1940. So now we're going to talk about the barrel address markings at the very top of the barrel. I'm going to start at 34 to make this a little bit more simpler to understand. The two-line address was from 1879 through 1940. That is only and only on the four and three quarter barrel. The four and three quarter barrel came out in 1879. So any gun that is a four and three quarter will have the two line barrel address. If you do not, that means your barrel was cut down from either a five and a half or seven and a half inch barrel. So now we'll go to number 33, which was the second style block address. So it, the, the actual dress itself was more blocky and that was from 76 till 1940 and that was on only the five and a half and seven and a half. So now we'll go to the very first one that came out and that one was in a italics address format and so it's a little bit more cursive -y italics font and that was from 1873 to 1876 and obviously again it was on the five and a half and seven and a half inch barrels. So now we're going to talk about the profile of the head of the ejector rod. Number 50 is known as the bullseye style. It was from 1873 to the very beginning of 1882. Number 51 is the oval crescent moon shape, but it, this one was very, very rare and only made for several months. And it was on the 1882 civilian model. And number 52 is the crescent moon shaped which is the more normal version of the crescent moon shaped. And that was at the very end of 1882 to 1940. Now, going back to number 51, I forgot to mention that that was actually used in 1884 on the military contract guns for that one year for several months as well. Now, this really isn't a change in the firearm. You have your, two, your ejector rod itself. And if you notice at the top, it is screwed in. That'll be important for the next part. But I'll just talk about these very quickly. You have your round style and then your flat style. Now the flat style was used on much smaller calibers to make it easier to eject. So now we're going to talk about the injector housing itself. And to understand those in a minute, I need you to look at these two barrels here. Number 45 is the very, very early style where it has a hole towards the right on the top. And then to the left of that hole is a screw hole. And that is how the, the one we're about to get into is held on. Now if you look at number 46, that's what most of us always see. It's the bushing and the screw hole all in one. 
So now the ejector rod housing for itself. Number 47 was the very first style and it had a closed back so that you could not remove the ejector rod itself without unscrewing the head off of it. And number 47 has also those two holes you were seeing before. The back one was a bushing and the front one was for the screw. Now this first style ejector rod housing was from 1873 to 1875. Now, number 48 was the second style, which was also closed, meaning you had to take apart that ejector rod to get it out. Now, that actually shared a common screw and locating boss, and that was from 1875 to 1877. And the third style, which is what we all, most of us are all used to, had an open back where you could remove the ejector rod and housing, uh, excuse me, the ejector rod and head, without taking it apart. And that was from 1877 to 1940. So in summary, from the year of 1873 to the year of 1940, there were 375,859 Colt single action armies that were made. They were offered in over 30 different calibers, with its most popular being 45 Colt and 4440, also known as 44 Winchester Centerfire. On top of all of that, it was made with multiple different barrel lengths. Longest normal was 7.5 to 5.5 to 4 and 3 quarters. But you could get it shorter and could get it much longer. Colt allowed for special orders. The Colt Single Action Army was used throughout history. It was adopted by the United States military and multiple other militaries. Now this wasn't every single change ever made. This was mostly the larger stuff that's easily noticeable and what you should look for if you are considering purchasing a first generation Colt Single Action Army. There is this tiny little book that you can carry around called the Colt Single Action Army and it was written by a man named Larry Hacker. This thing is amazing, it's very small, it can fit in your wallet and you can actually look up the amount of different calibers and when they were produced and all these changes on your own and easy to have with you. And these things are very, very important to make sure that what you're paying for is exactly what you're getting. If you like what you see here, I also have a video of me shooting this exact firearm you're looking at in the picture right now. Also, if you found this video worthy, please consider subscribing and liking. And I will see you guys in the next one.